Am I audible? Yes. Yep. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Rakhi Mahana, and I work as a project manager at QED42. You must have seen the booth downstairs. If not, then you must check it out now because there's an after party as well. Anyways, so today we're here to talk about outsourcing and some of the issues that you might have faced or you can face in the future if you decide to outsource your work. But before we start, let's just have a look at this. So what comes in your mind when you look at this? Discussion between the <laughs> Okay. For those who uh, do not know who these people are, they are two famous Bollywood celebrities. Akura Usho Samita Vachan is a resource to play the kid I don't remember. That's a good one. So I'll just send the base here. Uh, these are just two famous celebrities from a Bollywood blockbuster. And they're very famous in acting, but over here they're doing a bit support for a cricket ground. So what do you think they're doing actually? Are they doing it right? Can you ever imagine Paris Hilton doing investment advisory or Oprah with doing development or Sachin Tendulkar doing standard comedy? Can you imagine that? No. No? However fast you may run the person of your imagination, but it will be really hard to imagine. But all of these are successful people. Now why is that? Any guesses? They're in the right field. They're in the right field. Anything else? Right time, right decision. Right time, right decision. Okay. So in short, they're all focusing on their core competencies. So as Bill Gates says, companies should focus on their core competencies and outsource everything else. That's one major reason of outsourcing. There are plenty of other reasons as well. Let's just have a look at a video which I found really helpful in deciding should we really outsource work or not. So let's just have a look. Did you know that outsourcing that outsourcing is no longer a business, buzzword, or jargon? Research is piling up about outsourcing as a useful business tool. Globally, outsourcing is seen as a viable solution to many operational issues in small and big companies. Here are the top five reasons why outsourcing can boost your business to great heights. Outsourcing allows you to focus on core services. Outsourcing your non-core business functions will give you more flexibility to manage the core functions of your business. So management of non-core functions like call center operations, project development, and the like are transferred to your outsourcing partner. Finally, your company reaps all the advantages of your focused use of financial, human, and management resources to be more effective and efficient in your delivery of services. Outsourcing gives you access to high-value talents and skills. If you are a startup or a small firm, you do not immediately have access to skilled employees. Even big companies face the same issue as the cost of labor continues to rise. Outsourcing can then become your company's friend. The Filipino workforce ranks among the most globally competitive and skilled people. They are young, educated, English-speaking, and skilled. These labor force are also not left behind in keeping pace with the rapidly evolving technology, as well as making the most value out of your investment to offshore talents. The skills that these staff possess are suitable to any type of business processing operations. Outsourcing gives you the ability to cut costs. Cost reduction is often listed as one of the main reasons companies outsource. Depending on your goals, outsourcing can offer short to long term benefits. Starting with the flexibility that it gives in allowing your company to expand operations, there is also the added benefit of reducing capital and recurring cost expenses. Cheaper labor costs, low inflation, and big, big tax incentives allow you to save when you outsource. And with outsourcing, you can expect improved quality of service. Outsourcing helps improve service quality. Global companies are becoming more demanding to keep pace with the best business and service standard practice. As a tool, 
outsourcing can be effective in improving the quality of services through being innovative and flexible. With outsourcing, companies can now offer longer and more flexible service hours that can even sustain 24-7 operation. Outsourcing gives you access to technology. To keep up with the fast-paced changes in technology, startups and small companies can look up to outsourcing for help. Beside the cost of outsourcing, it is your outsourcing partner who usually invests and acquires new technological resources to match your clientele's operational needs. Sometimes, too, it is the outsourcing partner who even surpasses its customers in keeping pace with and in implementing new technologies. Of course, just five benefits are not all there is to expect when you sign an outsourcing contract. When done right, successful outsourcing can be an effective, resource-saving, and joyous endeavor. Together, we can help make you become that company and hope to see you become that happy and satisfied partner. Find out more ways to enjoy outsourcing. Big Outsource. So now that we know why outsourcing should be done, should we just get crappy? Will we close the session and probably start outsourcing work? Would you be able to do it right? And what if you do it wrong? Let's just have a look at some interesting examples. Okay. So there's one very interesting relation between Apple and a China-based company called Foxconn. Foxconn's massive capacity of producing iPhone and other Apple products at a really fast pace was an advantage to Apple, which is why it outsourced work to Foxconn. However, there were plenty of reports about Foxconn's abysmal treatment to its co-workers, which is why a lot of Americans were outraged and a lot of Apple officials got embarrassed. In short, the company's reputation suffered. Another uh, poster example for outsourcing would be Boeing. So Boeing was not new to outsourcing. It had outsourced a couple of times. It, it outsourced the production of landing gears, engines, and batteries to different contractors. In fact, 50 <coughs> top tier contractors. Now what it did in the process was that it completely surrendered the oversight of subcontracting. As a result of which, there were too many players doing too many pieces at one time with no centralized system of quality control. Well, quality and Boeing's reputation both suffered inevitably. And then there's this example of Samsung. So as per the economists, South Korean companies do not prefer outsourcing. And they think that American and European countries who outsource work are making a huge mistake in outsourcing as much manufacturing as they do. This is because they leave the other firms with an insight to their internal processes. It's because the, uh, the blueprint that Samsung followed was saying that it followed when it used to work as a subcontractor for a Japanese firm. So the loss of intellectual property, security threat, and plenty of other reasons how it could go wrong. But this doesn't mean that we should stop outsourcing. That's probably our core need, because we need to make sure that we are only focusing on our core competencies. So we still need to do it right, right? So the question here is, how do I do it right? You have to make sure that you choose the right partner when you do outsourcing. And when I say partner, think of it like this. If you have to choose a life partner, would you think of making even, a, even the minutest mistake in choosing a life partner? What could terribly go wrong if you do one small mistake? So choosing an outsourcing partner is equivalent to choosing a life partner because your project's life is depending on the, on the choice that you make. And um, people have different ideas of qualities that they would look for with their partner. I would just sum down some of the qualities that I feel should be important.
my idea of the qualities that you should have when you outsource your work from your partner. And you should never call them vendors. You should treat them as partners. Because until unless you think of your vendors as your partners, you're not going to have a successful project. So what are your ideas, or what do you think should be some capable qualities in any partner you outsource your work to? Um, any inputs? What qualities should your partner have? Dependable, right? Yeah, so in short, we need to have these bare minimum qualities in the partner we outsource our work to. Now, now that we know all the qualities that you need to use in order to judge somebody while you're outsourcing your project, the next question that comes is how do I go about it? So the first thing that you do on the list is ask yourself. And ask a lot of questions, as many as you can. Because you first need to know where do you need help, how much help is required, and what is the timeline by which you need to get the help you need. So you need to ask yourself these questions. Once you have your requirements, you need to have a very crisp checklist based on your requirements. Now that will vary from project to project. There, there, there can always be a generic checklist, but then based on your requirements, the checklist could vary. So you prepare your checklist of evaluation criteria all your requirements that you need to get done in your project itself. <coughs> After that, you have to make sure that you don't go to just one partner, or you don't just blindly go and pick up one partner. It's always good to have good prospects. So you go and find out a couple of prospects who can become, out of which one can become your partner in the work that you need to get done. And then you, while you do that, you have to choose whether the person, the, the partner that you're picking up is the right fit for your partner or not. So you have to make sure that these choices fall in place. So which one will you choose? Getting a list of prospects is probably simple. Uh, you can always get that from recommendation. That is where publicity kicks in. But which one do you choose? And how do you go about choosing the right partner? Well, in order to do so, first you need to make sure that you follow the simplest possible criterion for partner search, which is the 3C criteria as we know it, compatibility, capability, and commitment. Uh, is everyone in the room here aware of Drupal? Yeah, just a raise of hands. Everybody? Okay, so I'm in the right room. Anyway, so now that I'm just focusing on a Drupal-centric audience, I'll talk about how you do outsourcing for your Drupal projects. So based on these three criteria, we talk about each one of them in detail, but this is the gist of it. So based on all of these three criteria, you can always easily decide how to go about choosing an outsourcing partner. And the reason why I picked up choosing this, this as a topic was because um, we got a project and there were, uh, so when we selected the code, we realized that there were comment messages from different companies. And not one, not two, not three, but eight different companies. We were actually the ninth one. And my question was not why we are the ninth. My question was how much pain, how much money, how much time was spent by the client in order to go about it, doing something, getting built nothing. So they spent a lot of time and money, but actually got nothing in return. So that was a really pitching point. And that is when we came up with this, these three criteria for choosing a, a compatible partner. When we talk about compatibility, you have to make sure that the partner you choose with you're really compatible to work with that person's partner. And here, mostly, most of the outsourcing happens in the countries which have different time zones. You usually do not outsource work to a very local vendor because then there's hardly any cost difference. You also have to take care of the cost benefits that you can get out of outsourcing. So you do the cross-country uh, cross outsourcing. And when you do that, you have to make sure how manageable are the cross-cultural and the cross-corporate culture differences. So both of your cultures need to align in some way or the other, at least in, in the vision of goals. So in, term of, in terms of your goals, how you can manage the time zone differences, the language differences, and whether your work ethics align with your partner or not, these are some crucial factors to evaluate. 
No, language is not the only factor, uh, and language does not come for, for regional languages, but it's also about the vocabulary or the terminology that we use in order to communicate to each other and understand the requirements of writing. For example, what I understand from a module would be very different from what a person from a non-technical background would understand from a module. So you have to make sure that through these initial discussions, you come on the same page and you, you, have, you develop that understanding of requirements very easily. And again, the rule number one is ask many questions. As many questions as possible. A lot can go wrong if you don't ask the right questions. Last on the list is management practices. We know that developers are, are dudes. Without them, the open source project could not be delivered. But trust me, project managers are studs. Without them, you cannot. The chances of having a successful project delivered is really slim. So you have to make sure that you have the right point of contact with them. Developers probably understand their language and they're really pickups of what they do. But you have to make sure that somebody from the client is in as well and from somebody from your partner is in as well. Both have that non-technical language of conversation as well. Because even in the work that you need to get done. And then while you do that, you have to choose whether the person, the, the partner that you're picking up is the right fit for your partner or not. So you have to make sure that these choices fall in place. So which one will you choose? Getting a list of prospects is probably simple. Uh, we can always get that from recommendation. That is where publicity kicks in. But which one do you choose? And how do you go about choosing the right partner? Well, in order to do so, first you need to make sure that you follow the simplest possible criterion for partner search, which is the three C criteria as we know it, compatibility, capability, and commitment. Uh, is everyone in the room here aware of Drupal? Yeah, just a raise of hands. Everybody? Okay, so I'm in the right room. Anyway, so now that I'm just focusing on a Drupal centric audience, I'll talk about how you do outsourcing for your Drupal projects. So based on these three criteria, we talk about each one of them in detail. But this is the gist of it. So based on all of these three criteria, you can always easily decide how to go about choosing an outsourcing partner. And the reason why I picked up choosing this, this as a topic was because um, we got a project and there were, uh, so while inspecting the code, we realized that there were comment messages from different companies. And not one, not two, not three, but eight different companies. We were actually the ninth one. And my question was not why we are the ninth. My question was, how much pain, how much money, how much time was spent by the client in order to go about it, doing something, getting built nothing. So they spent a lot of time and money, but actually got nothing in return. So that was a really pitching point. And that is when we came up with this three three criteria for choosing a, a compatible partner. When we talk about compatibility, you have to make sure that the partner you choose with you're really compatible to work with that person partner. And here, mostly, most of the outsourcing happens in the countries which have different time zones. You usually do not outsource work to a very local vendor because then it's having any cost difference. You also have to take care of the cost benefits that you can get out of outsourcing. So you do the cross-country uh, cross outsourcing. And when you do that, you have to make sure how manageable are the cross-cultural and the cross-corporate culture differences. So both of your cultures need to align in some way or the other, at least in, in the vision of goals. So in, term of, in terms of your goals, how you can manage the time zone differences, the language differences, and whether your work ethics align with your partner or not, these are some crucial factors to evaluate. Now, language is not the only factor, uh, and language does not come for, for regional languages, but it's also about the vocabulary or the terminology that we use in order to communicate to each other and understand the requirements of well. For example, what I understand from a module would be very different from what a person from a non-technical background would understand from a module. So you have to make sure that through these initial discussions, you come on the same page and you, you, you develop that understanding of requirements very easily. And again, the rule number one is ask many questions. As many questions as possible. A lot can go wrong if you don't ask the right questions. Last on the list is management practices. We know that 
developers are, are dudes. Without them, the open source project could not be delivered. But trust me, project managers are studs. Without them, you cannot. The chances of having a successful project delivered is really slim. So you have to make sure that you have the right point of contact as well. Developers probably understand their language, and they're really pickups at what they do. But you have to make sure that somebody from the client end as well, and from somebody from your partner's end as well, both have that non-technical language of conversation as well. Because even but you may not be able to look it straight. But uh, you should have enough trust on your on your choice, on your partners, that they will be able to guide you for such things. And there might be very important features that you miss out. And they can point out that if you're building something like this, then with my experience, I can say you should also get X plus Y features. These are really important. So that that kind of consultancy won't have to come. Spoke about uh, Foxconn and Apple, probably one of the most successful partnerships Apple yeah. has built, right? But yes, there was an issue of probably like employees not being treated well. Yeah, they didn't they fix it. Great, right? Probably they fixed it, that's what they say. But yeah. in the Indian context, like you know, a lot of work, uh, outsourcing happens from outside, how do they get to know whether black people here treat their people well? Right? How do you assure them that you do that? Yeah. And where is it? Like, I don't see anything, any cultural indication. How does the person across, like, say, in Los Angeles or California, like, you know, New York, know that the company I'm outsourcing with, they are treating all the employees well, paying them the well. How does it show up? Like, how do you guys do that? How would like to know? Okay. So, if you really want to judge on, um, on what is the company's culture or what kind of activities they do, whether the employees are being happy or not, one easy, uh, may not be very helpful, but way of doing that would be checking out the company's website for blogs in particular, written by employees which are not culture, uh, which are not develop, like developer-centric blogs, but culture-centric blogs. People, and that would not be written by company officials. There would be employee authors who would be doing that. It would probably be published with the company's consent, but you can always check out blogs. And apart from that, now is the time of social media. Go check out the company's Facebook page. There'll be lots and lots of picture depicting company's culture. Uh, that yes, that depends on the kind of company you are hiring. It would be very difficult to find out the culture of the company, which is very huge because the the part that you are outsourcing or the smaller team that you're going to outsource work to, you may not be able to specifically find out that particular part because you don't know in the very beginning who's going to work for you. But on the company as a whole, you can always check out social media. That would help. Some extent. Can I add here? Can yes. I add here? Yeah. So, uh, so, as Raki mentioned, obviously, two key outcomes that uh, which I have seen uh, being working into uh, sales and pre sales. Uh, typically, uh, if the, when they release the RFI and then RFP, so in RFI itself, they will ask a lot of questions. What is your code of conduct? What is your uh, talent man talent management? What about what about your <coughs> uh, privacy policies? Uh, what about your security stuff? And, and whole lot of quality and blah blah. So all that set of questions they will ask in RFI, which is on a very high level. Rather and then then when you go to RFP phase, they again drill down. And when you get further selected for the presentation and the final negotiation, they really really get everything what they need. So that's how I see, but now in the digital world, if you see all the social media and blog and all that, even that gives you more clear picture. Yeah, you can always ask for information, but if you don't believe, again, you have to need to have trust. But if you don't believe that the information provided is up to date or correct, then that way social media helps. Are you say something? Yeah, just to add, like, I think the, one of the points that Denise raised today morning, like, you know, you see a lot of companies. Uh, doing contribution from the company account, that's a slap <coughs> that the culture is not open if the individuals are not contributing, like yeah. especially in open source. And like if any company is masking you to directly talk to a developer, that's also a smell. Yeah, I think I get that. It's so if, if companies can do that, that speaks about the trust that you know, the company has. If they are masking, there is something wrong. I know some companies like you know have some of their favorite. Uh, I, think this is a, I think that was like you know 
that answer gives a confidence to a client. That, I think that kind of an answer gives the kind of confidence that you know, if you can have your developer interface directly with the client, then the company has enough trust and the culture is very open. Otherwise, like you know, there is few favorite people go and put stuff in glass door which kind of averages out the ratings. Foxconn stuff never came out from the Fox, uh, Facebook side, so stuff it was interrogative reporting, right? Which is very difficult to do for small companies. But I think yes, I think these are things which if people do, if companies put their employees in the front and they can make them the face, the confidence right. that people see in the employees talking, I think, I think yeah, that, I think that's a great way. I have a point to share in this regard also. You, know, like you, you raised the issue which was related to maybe a company sitting in US, they are outsourcing a project to an Indian company which is not that big, right? So, say there is a language barrier also. A developer may be best at coding things, right? But may not be best at, you know, negotiating or dealing with the clients directly. So, there, that's where the interface is also required. But at least when we, when we talk about culture of the organization, you know, which I truly believe in, that there are certain value system that the company sitting in US have, and a certain value system that the company sitting in India has, right? If there is a map between the two, maybe a small map, maybe not everything would be mapped, but maybe a couple of things if they are mapping, okay, I'm at a comfort zone, okay. They have a certain value system which is mapping with mine, and I can talk about it. Uh, it might be difficult in the beginning when you're outsourcing uh, for them to directly introduce their developers to you. But for plenty of reasons, uh, one being that you, they, they're not sure whether you're really outsourcing, so they cannot spend developer time in, into pre-sales. So they may, may not put developer as the face of the company. So they would put somebody else in the face of the company. That is why uh, the background checks that we do, the references that we get, you can always talk to, and you can always ask the vendor or the partner you will choose directly. Is it okay if I speak to your preferences? The people that you mention as references, they should be good, good to talk about you, right? So you can always ask for those references. They would know that if, uh, when, because uh, what happens is that when a project is in progress, um, you will always see the team interacting with the client directly. That happens. And when the teams interact with the clients, then you see that, um, that openness or that um, the employee culture that comes out during those conversations, but it's e it's a little hard to know that in the very beginning. So to do that, you can do that reference check and then social media and Facebook and blog post, not the Glassdoor blog post, but definitely the company blog post written by the company employees here and there. So that helps. And like they mentioned, uh, the outs uh, the open source contributions. Any company who doesn't have a good culture may not promote. That's yeah. So they may not be contributions. Right. So contributions speak for themselves in a way. Okay. And last on the list was communication. So everything apart, it cannot be a successful project if there isn't proper communication from all ends, whether it is questions from the developers or questions from the pre-sales team or questions from the client who's outsourcing. The questions have to come and they have to come in the right way. So you communicate really well. And communication is the key to having a successful project outsource. So I think that was all of it. That's how you choose the right partner. Um, there are a lot of other things as well which will be specific to your projects. So if you have any additional questions, um, you can write to me, I can give you my card. Uh, you can write to me or you can call it directly. Or you can also meet me at the clinic or you can both if needed. For now, we just have a quick question on the session if there are additional questions here. Like, how do they identify the things that you need to outsource? Okay, yes, that's a good question. How do you identify what you need to outsource? So here, uh, first I would just like to know what exactly are you doing right now? Okay, and do you have an in-house technical team? Yes, we do. Okay, a fresh team or a very strong team? Relatively strong team. Okay, so here, uh, I really think you would need to outsource development work, but if you are just started and you want clients, okay, so the outsourcing of marketing, that can be done. You can always choose. That is if you really need it. If you're getting clients on your own, you would not even need to hire somebody else to do the marketing stuff. So first question is, what help do you need? 
Do you really need help in any 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 domain? Of course. The okay. one is marketing. Other one is a recruitment. Okay. And we may have a couple of other items as well. Right. So again, right is like I said, development because you are already already relatively strong. So you would not need to hire an agency for development. But you would definitely need partners who can help you with recruitments. And there again, you need to make sure that these I think these points stand out. Although the references and the the contributions and all would be different. The references will be completely different from a Drupal uh, uh, developing shop than a hiring shop. But yes, you can always check those. So you, you need to identify where help you need. You need help in marketing, like you said. You yourself answered your question in a way. You need help in marketing. But and still, but still, it's very. Uh, it's a situation of dilemma. Should I be outsourcing my accounts? I'm not sure. <coughs> If you outsource this to the right partner, because there are people who do account management, who, are, who manage your finances. Obviously, Paris Hilton doesn't do her own tax management. She, she does it, somebody else does it for her. So there are people who do that, but you have to make sure that you trust the right people, you go to the right people. And the choice of that would again be dependent on how you choose your prospects. So that has to be our end. But again, the first question is, what do you need to outsource? Like that. Uh, does your organization does any outsourcing? No, we take over. <laughs> it's the other way around. Yeah, it's the other way around. But I actually, uh, the reason I'm delivering this talk is because I just found some problems that other people are facing in outsourcing. And the things that we realize we offer as consultants, uh, after which, so even off topic, like not really related to project work, but as consultants, if we offer some advice, how our clients take it, that uh, that kind of those kind of inputs from the client maybe deliver the stock about outsourcing because it becomes really difficult to find the right partner. Some of the companies what they also do is they hire a third party uh, Drupal expert to check in with you on your technical skills because they don't have the technical expertise in place. That again depends on your budget. So that is something which is it has to be cost effective if you want to do it. So I did not include that in the presentation, but that is also one thing. So we take work, so if you have work, we, we do it for you. In light of this, like, though we are good at development, development is kind of a broad spectrum, right? Yeah. We do have SEO, we do have hosting, that also part of development. So we are wondering if we should have our own team for those stuffs, or should we outsource? That depends on cost, again, yeah, your yes. budget. So it has to be cost effective. Your core competency is again development. And by development, I mean, coding and website development. SEO is something that I don't really feel that a development shop needs to hire a different agency altogether, maybe hire people to do the SEO work, because it has to be cost effective in, in the end. You cannot go beyond your budget and hire or go and subcontract multiple things to multiple people and then have the extra role of managing all of that when you actually could have done that doing in house. Yeah. Okay. Mom, suppose my institution, my company company needs to hire this uh, developer's team. Okay. So will I be hiring only the developer's team or will the team lead the team manager? There has to be a manager with the team. So, so you need to interact with the team. The interaction will be manager to manager level, not the basic developer's level. So it uh, depends on how technically sound you are. If you if you yourself come from a technical background and you can understand the technical job easily, you can interact with the technical team as well. And they can speak technically to you. But if not, then you will always have one point of contact in the partner you are outsourcing your work to who will be able to understand your language which is non-technical and give you the solution even with the same language. So suppose uh, their work culture and our work culture is completely different, their vision is different. So how do you just fall in sync with that? What kind of difference again? Like, uh, every, every company has a different vision like uh, the goal of their company. So my company has a different way, like we have mostly a friendly atmosphere in the company. Maybe they uh, follow a hierarchical atmosphere. So okay. how do you just fall in sync with that? So I'm a student. I have no idea about this. I'm just asking out of curiosity. These yeah, so you should ask these questions to the, to the partner itself. As to what is your company culture? Do you have a flat hierarchy or do you have a level hierarchy? <coughs> Can people directly come and talk to, talk to the CEO or do they have to go through levels and then talk to that? So, so for example, we have a flat hierarchy. Anybody can go and talk to anyone. No questions asked. So I think that's a friendlier way or probably a friendlier atmosphere, which is also something important for any company to do well, for the employees to be happy. 
I mean, you would not want that. The if the person just above you is not in good talking terms to you, you lose everything that you have right now <coughs> because just your senior is not speaking well to you. You can relate to go up. So that flat hierarchy is actually a good point. Uh, Ma'am, I want to ask one question. Yeah. Now, uh, I am very new to Drupal, actually, and uh, we want to migrate our website to Drupal. Okay. okay. Now, after coming here and attending this Drupal camp, I understood that Drupal is completely different. Now, it's not something which is like <coughs> proper IT managed services like, like in the past we had like IT services which were very much you know uh, I would say streamlined. And Drupal is something; it's an open source platform, so we need developers who have contributed or worked on Drupal for a longer period of time. Now, I, as I need to migrate my website, I mean, in talking about in Drupal, like, you know, how is outsourcing works? Or should I be trying to hire someone in-house? Or it will be better for me to, uh, you know, outsource? So, here, uh, apart from cost, one important factor will be time. If you decide of hiring somebody in-house, training the person, and even bearing the extra infrastructure cost of providing internet facilities and laptops and other logistics. So that cost, and then uh, outsourcing your work to a Drupal development shop who can do it, who are already skilled, they've done something similar before. So it depends on what you prefer. Do you have enough time and money to spend on training uh, and the infrastructure and all? So if not, then you should definitely go and outsource your work. So you know, I, we can hire in-house also, but okay. After migrating, I mean, do we really need a Drupal developer for a long term? No, you don't. I mean, uh, it depends on the kind of project, but in general, you don't really need a, a technical agency to support you. It's a CMS. So the content management is really simple, provided you hire the right person who does a very simplified architecture. So here, your first requirement is you want a simplified website whose content management is simple enough for you who doesn't have technical uh, Drupal expertise to understand that and to use that on a daily basis. Obviously, if you want value additions or additional features to be added in future, you would go back to that shop or maybe have a new shop. There should be documentation again, depending on where you go back to. But then, uh, the CMS requirement in itself is that it needs to be simple enough for you to understand it. So you would not need to have any in-house Drupal team to manage the content. So I have like, you know, from web content specialist people. So they basically do authoring. And then we have a huge marketing team, which are completely non-technical. Yeah, so you so have. So we need to train them. You know, once we migrate, we obviously need to train them, and they should be able to work on Drupal. They should be able and, to. Uh, set. Trust me, the training to manage content on Drupal is very simple. Depending on the length or huge the volume of the website, if the training days can vary from two days to a month time, that's maximum. But I I'm not even going to a month month long training. But doing the right amount of trainings at the right intervals in the project, you could probably do it with just five days of training. And your web content managers, who, who, who the content authors, they can manage it themselves. They don't even need that much training. If, it's, um, if they know just how to use a laptop, they would be able to do it. That's all. Okay. One more thing I'm, I'm a little uncertain of is on a longer run, mm -hmm. if there are new versions of Drupal <coughs> that get launched, so do I need to always like upgrade my website to the new version? That would be a good thing to do. Uh, in the longer run, you mean 15 years, 20 years? No, maybe maybe two years down the line or like. I don't think two years down the line you'll have another version of Drupal. Drupal 8 took a lot of time to come, and Drupal okay. 8 is very powerful. Probably here onwards, migrating from a, a Drupal version to the next Drupal version would become simpler. In fact. Mm -hmm. Without Drupal 8 release, there were already 57,000 plus websites on Drupal 8. So just imagine the power of Drupal that without even actually having Drupal 8 specific, uh, everything available without the proper Drupal 8 release, there were people who had already started building on it. So it wouldn't be very hard to migrate a website from one version to another. And probably if you're talking a few years down the line, you might have too much to do that. Uh, that is something that I'm just guessing. I don't know yet. But it would not be that difficult to do it. And you would not have to do it every two years or every three years. That is when a new Drupal version came, comes and that takes time. Okay, one well, last question. Just to, uh, just to so Drupal version upgrade, uh, if you mean there are uh, two types of upgrades you can do. One is a major release and a minor release. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, releases like uh, 8.1, 8.2, 8.1.1, 8.1.2, right? And in every release, they publish something called a release note. You read the release note and see whether that release note has something to do with your website. 
if it is a security release, and if that security release affects your site, you do it immediately. If the security release that does not uh, have any impact on your site, you can postpone it to the next week of other release. So it's not mandatory to always upgrade, but you have to read the release notes and then decide what to release. Okay, thanks. And that is usually not a big problem. Uh, one last question. Yeah, sure. So uh, Drupal, as it's an open source platform, and uh, ours is like a business uh, website. So I mean, how feasible it is, and is it like a secure platform? Yeah, uh, Drupal gives a variety of regions or domains. I would say from e-commerce to business to publishing to CSR, social website. Yeah, it's it's a very good platform. Yeah, it's a good platform. I, I have I don't really I haven't yet come across a kind of website that cannot be written Drupal. There might be something where content management would be tedious, which is why it cannot be off to Drupal, but I haven't come across one yet. And for business websites, because uh, we commonly build brand websites and CSR websites and e commerce and publishing. So I know that this can be done. Thanks. Okay. I was just saying Drupal actually each every release. If you if you take it six, if you take it seven, usually give the lifespan of four to five years. So let's say current your version of Drupal site may be on a seven. So don't worry for another three years until you get the full matured um, Drupal eight. The, you know Drupal .org will support you n minus one, which is like if your current version latest version is eight, they will actually support you all security patch and everything till seven. But if you have six. Then it's a worry. So th that's how you have to think. So don't think each and every time to go up, go ahead and migrate. And um, the guy has mentioned like if it is related to your site, if it is related to security, then just update that patch only. Don't don't go to you know all the. So that's one thing. And now that you have, now that you have like this. Probably the partner that you hire to do your work, you can directly ask them these questions and even uh, discuss that kind of an engagement. If at all you need it, then how would that be managed? Because if you know of some things, then it's better to be on the safer side and to discuss those things, get that get that covered up so that we get to so. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, thank you everyone for coming. Nice to talk to you. I'm just giving you my cards. If you need me to contact for anything, I will do outsourcing, but I can take your work. So if there's anything that you need to get done, or if you are going to do outsourcing and you have questions, then you can always write to me or call me directly. Like so, all right to me. Thank you.